Welcome back, students, to another semester of physical chemistry. This second semester of physical chemistry does not pick up where we left off last semester. So last semester, we were primarily interested in quantum mechanics, and we explored how chemistry worked on the atomic and subatomic levels, and we were also very interested in spectroscopy. This semester, we are going to study thermodynamics, which does not, at least obviously, build off of quantum mechanics. So in thermodynamics, what we're going to do is investigate the bulk properties of substances. So in quantum mechanics, we were very interested in, say, how a single molecule of HCl absorbed infrared light, and quantum mechanics was very important for that. What we're interested here is not so much that, but we're interested in how 10 moles of HCl gas occupies a given volume at a given pressure and temperature. And so this is the kind of, of stuff that we're studying. And it, quantum mechanics isn't necessarily needed for this. Um, so what we're going to do is start this class in a place that maybe doesn't seem very chemistry. We're going to start on ideal gases. And then we're going to extend our concepts uh, of uh, from ideal gases to real gases. We'll look at liquids. We'll talk about phase changes. We'll do and, and more things than that. Um, and in the final month or so of the semester, we're going to bring quantum mechanics back in and show that using quantum mechanics, it's the same result as we would by using these bulk properties of the system. Uh, and that's going to be a, a study called statistical uh, mechanics. So. When we hear thermodynamics, at least when I heard thermodynamics before I started uh, taking PCAM and then teaching PCAM, what I remembered was that was that like unit we did in Gen Chem and we had delta H, we had delta S, we had delta G, and we determined if a reaction was going to be spontaneous or not. And that is an important component of thermodynamics, and we will do all of those things in this class. But thermodynamics is much more than that. It goes much more beyond something like free energy to a whole bunch of other properties of the system. And understanding these things is important for the chemist to be able to do. So the one of the main results from something like thermodynamics, this is something that you're all very familiar with, is the ideal gas law. And we're going to start today by looking at the ideal gas law. Before we get into that, let's go ahead and talk about our learning goals. So the learning goals for today are going to be to understand the microscopic origins of pressure. And we'll, we'll talk about temperature a little bit. We'll talk about that more in class. We'll hold off on that in this lecture. Um, and then, of course, to be able to apply the ideal gas law. This is just as easy as you remember it being from high school in Chenkin. We're going to see, especially in the first few weeks here, a lot of terms and definitions. And just like something, just like anything else, so think of biochemistry. A biochemistry class would be very hard if you didn't know, say, the language of biochemistry, like the given nucleotides or amino acids. If someone said ATP and you had no idea what that meant, biochemistry would be a very hard class. And the same is going to be true for thermodynamics. So there are some definitions that we really need to get down uh, solid in order to be able to communicate and read the textbook and understand each other as we talk about this. We'll start that today and continue on the next few weeks with that. And we'll see here in this first uh, chapter, we'll see the zeroth law of thermodynamics. So this is kind of an interesting case. You may be familiar with three laws of thermodynamics. And this zeroth law was formulated after the three laws of thermodynamics that we will discuss in the coming weeks here. Uh, but it kind of is more basic than all of them. And so instead of making it the fourth law, it became the zeroth law. And we'll see what that is and how we use that at the end of class today. So like I said a minute ago, we are going to start by thinking about the microscopic origins of pressure. And you know how the pressure of a system changes. You're very familiar with this from high school and gen chem. If we have a certain system, it has, and assuming of course it's a gas, uh, that gas has a pressure, it has a volume, it has a temperature, it has a number of molecules, and these things are all related in the ideal gas law that is PV equals nRT. So this ideal gas law first was Boyle's law um, in the 1600s, and that was just P1V1 equals P2V2, and a simple observation. And, and eventually temperature was roped in there as well, because for P1V1 to equal P2V2, the temperature has to be constant. If the temperature is changing, the pressure and volume change, and so forth. 
So the ideal gas law was put together from a large number of observations by men like Isaac Newton, Boyle, uh, Gay-Lussac, and Dalton, and other men as well. And they just observed gases and said, well, when I increase the pressure of the gas, the volume goes down. If I increase it twice, the volume goes down twice, and I can make a law based on that. And that is basically what we'll be doing in thermodynamics, is we'll be looking at observations and saying, okay, what happens to a system as I do something? So as I change the volume of the system, what happens to the internal energy of that system, uh, and so forth. And we'll talk more about internal energy next time. At the end of the class, we'll, we'll bring back quantum mechanics a little bit, and I want to start off with that as well. I want to ask the question, why is the ideal gas law true? So we can observe that PV equals NRT, but why does PV equal NRT? Can we say why or does it really have to accept our observations? So we're going to look into this, try to see if we can figure out why the ideal gas law is the way it is. And to do this, we're going to look at the microscopic origins of pressure. So for the most part in this class, at least for the first two months or so, we are going to be focusing exclusively on uh, macroscopic properties. But here we'll look at microscopic properties. And what I mean by microscopic is concerning individual atoms. So for example, if I consider a, a glass of water as a glass of water, I'm considering bulk properties, macroscopic properties. If I'm considering water as individual water molecules, hydrogen bonded to each other, now I'm thinking about microscopic properties. So why do gases exert a pressure. Uh, and we've you've covered this before in previous classes, I think you'll probably be able to come up with this answer, is that gases exert pressure because they are physical molecules and they collide with walls. And if you have molecules colliding with a wall, that's going to exert some pressure. Now the gas molecules individually are very light, but when you have a large number of them, say a mole, that adds up and you actually have some substantial pressure here. So what we're going to do here in this first section is try to use quantum mechanics to actually figure out what the pressure molecules would make with the border, uh, what the boundary of a system would be. All right, so we're here on the whiteboard and we want to figure out what is pressure. So why do gases exert a pressure and what kind of pressure do they exert? We'll start with the basic physical definition of pressure. So if you think back to physics, you may remember, that pressure is simply force over an area. And if you've ever been roughhousing as a kid and had like a sibling sit on top of you, you know that they exert a pressure on you. They have a gravitational force and that's exerted over an area. So if someone like stands on you with one foot, it hurts really bad. If they lay on top of you, it doesn't really hurt so bad because the area is larger. So what is this pressure still? I'm gonna build this up. Well, the force, um, we can describe the force of an object using Newton's second law. The force is simply the mass times the acceleration. So let's say that pressure is then equal to the mass times the acceleration over uh, the area that it's exerting over. And now what is this? We'll, we'll take another step and say that the acceleration is simply the time derivative of velocity. So the pressure then is the mass over the area, and we'll replace the time derivative of velocity for acceleration. From here, what we're going to do is bring that m back into the derivative. So if I have the derivative not only of the velocity, but the derivative of m times velocity, well, the mass is constant, so the derivative of m times velocity is simply the momentum. And so what we have then is an expression for pressure. The pressure, uh, which we started as saying pressure is force over area, we can also represent the pressure as the time derivative of momentum over the area. So we need to do this because we know that there's some change in momentum going on with our molecules at the molecular level, and we wanna build up the pressure from there. So what is it? What is the pressure change of our uh, system with respect to time? So what we're going to do is consider a boundary. We'll draw a wall here, and we have a particle. Now, this particle is going to be moving. It's going to be moving in some random direction with some random velocity. And what we're going to do is say, well, this wall here is a wall that's separating only the x dimension. And so when this molecule collides with the wall, let me go ahead and move this down so you can kind of see this here. Let's change color too. So when this molecule collides with the wall, what's going to happen? And I think we all remember from physics what's going to happen is it's going to bounce off 
it's going to retain its uh, momentum in, in this case, the y direction. It's going to keep going up. And it's going to have reversed its uh, momentum in the x direction. And so what we're going to do then is say that we have this velocity. We have a velocity component that is vx. And that's the velocity in the x direction. And that's the only thing that's changing here. So our particle, if we want to know the change in momentum, uh, what our particle is doing is it's starting having a momentum uh, that is mvx, where the m is the mass of the particle. And at the end of the collision, it has a momentum that's negative mvx. So the change in momentum that is p final minus p initial is negative mvx minus mvx, which is equal to minus 2mvx. So what's the pressure, what's the momentum that's exerted to the boundary? Well, if the particle experiences negative 2 mvx worth of momentum, that means the boundary here must experience positive 2 mvx worth of momentum per collision. Here we're going to assume that we have a uniform mass of our particles. We have the same particle and then maybe we have a helium balloon or something like that. What we need to do now to figure out the pressure is we can say, well, one collision of one molecule will result in a change of momentum of 2 mvx. But how many do we have? Right? We need to know the change in momentum with respect to time. So how many molecules will collide with the wall in a given time? And so what we're going to do to figure that out is set out a boundary. So we're going to set a boundary here on the wall. And this is going to give us a, a space here, um, a physical volume. And what's happening here is we have particles that are moving in the x direction, and they're going to collide with the wall. And this box is chosen such that the length, delta x, is equal to vx delta t. So there's what this box is. It's the, the section of space where all of the molecules that are moving in the forward x direction will collide with the wall in our given step delta t. So how many collisions do we have? We'll set up an expression for this. And so I'll, when I use a capital N, that is usually, if not almost exclusively, going to refer to a number. So this is the number of collisions that might be one, it might be a thousand, it might be a mole, right? It's going to be just a number. And the number of collisions in this case is equal to the following. So it's equal to n with this tilde on top of it. And what this is, is the number density, which is kind of like a concentration. We'll break this down in a second. So it's equal to the number density, and then it's uh, times the area. So the area of this wall here that we're colliding with, we can make it a volume. Um, so we're considering a certain area of this boundary. And then it's equal to the length of this box, right? So it's equal to essentially what we're doing is saying the number of particles uh, here times the area times delta x, which is the volume. So uh, the particles in this box will collide with the wall, but only if they're moving in the forward direction. So if they're moving in the reverse direction, they will not collide with the wall in a unit time. So to account for that, we're going to multiply this by one half. So half of the uh, molecules in this volume will collide with the wall if they have a, the right Vx. Um, so we can break this up and say this is equal to the number density times the area times Vx delta t, and then we'll times one half here. So what is our number density? Our number density is simply the number of molecules. So here I'm putting n. So this capital N is for number of molecules. So this might be 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Right? It's the number of molecules that we have uh, divided by the volume. Now, it's often uh, inconvenient to write the number of molecules. Um, and what we're going to do instead, most often, is instead of writing the number of molecules, we'll simply write the number of moles multiplied by Avogadro's number divided by the volume here. So if we had 1 uh, times 10 to the 23rd, um, we instead of writing 1 times 10 to the 23rd, we would write about 1 sixth mole right, times Avogadro's number. And that's going to give us the right number of molecules. So we can go ahead and put this back into the number of collisions. So our number of collisions is equal to the number of moles times Avogadro's number divided by the volume of the system times the area times the velocity in the x direction 
times delta t, our unit of time here, and then times one half, because only half of the molecules are moving in the forward direction. So we can go back in and put this into the total momentum change. So the momentum change that is felt by the wall here, delta p total, this is going to be the sum of all of the collisions. We already decided that one collision felt a change in momentum of a 2 mvx. So we simply have to multiply 2 mvx by the number of collisions. And we already have an expression for this. So we can substitute this guy in here for the number of collisions. And what we get when we do that is we get n times Avogadro's number divided by the volume. And then we have the area, we have the change in time, we have the mass, and then I'm gonna put here Vx squared. So here I have these brackets, and I think we saw this a little bit last semester. These brackets refer to an average. So what we're recognizing here is that when you have a gas, and we'll talk about this much uh, more later in the semester, the gas molecules don't all have the same velocity. We can actually use the Boltzmann distribution to describe the range of velocities that they have, but they have an average velocity. And when we're considering the bulk properties, it turns out it's good enough to just consider the average velocity uh, for these particles. And again, we'll look into why this is uh, more later in the semester. So instead of just having a single x velocity, we're representing the bulk properties of the system here, all the different particles that we have, by an average velocity. And that's the average velocity squared because we have a Vx term here and a Vx term here. So then what is the pressure? We're going to go ahead and plug this back in. So our pressure, remember, is equal to one over the area we're considering uh, and then times the change in pressure over the change in time. So here we're doing a little bit of a trick that we can do sometimes. And instead of evaluating the uh, pressure derivative, we can just say what's well, delta P over delta T. And that's usually a good approximation for the derivative. So we'll go ahead and plug our numbers in here. We'll have one over A delta T. And then our delta P that we just calculated is N Avogadro's number over the volume, A delta T M Vx squared. So we can cancel out A delta T and we're left with our pressure being N times Avogadro's number over the volume, and then we have M Vx squared. So now we're left asking, what is the average velocity? And again, just like the other things with the kinetic theory of gases, we'll talk about that later in the semester. It's like chapter 33 or something around there. And so what we're gonna do for now is we're gonna suffice it to say that the velocity that gas molecules have is related to the temperature. And this is something that I think we're comfortable with um, is that higher temperature means more energy, more energy means faster speed. And so it turns out that if we're just considering velocity in the X direction that we are, um, one half mvx squared, right? And we can recognize this as the kinetic energy of a particle in one dimension is equal to one half kt, where k is the Boltzmann constant. Um, this is a constant, you can grab it in, up in your book, look it up online. It's something like 1.318, uh, I think, times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. It's a very small number. And so we can make this substitution here. We can say our pressure is now equal to N times Avogadro's number over the volume times uh, KT in this case, because our one half will cancel, so times KT. Now we can do one final change here. And this is comes from the recognition that the Boltzmann constant K is equal to the gas constant R divided by Avogadro's number. So what that means is that R is equal to Avogadro's number times the Boltzmann constant. And what do you know? We have that here. So what we get then is that the pressure is equal to NRT over V. In other words, PV equals NRT or the ideal gas law. You may feel unimpressed going through this derivation. We ended up with the ideal gas law and everybody already knows that. 
But take a second to think about what we did. What we did is we described the bulk behavior of every gas, as long as it's ideal, and we'll look more into what makes a gas ideal in the next couple of weeks. We described the properties of every gas just based on considering, hey, well, these gases are real molecules and they have a certain velocity and they collide with the boundary of the container they're in that exerts a pressure, and this is what the pressure is. So this is not where the ideal gas law came from. Like I mentioned earlier, the ideal gas law comes from men making observations for like 100 years on changing the volume and pressure and temperature of gases and seeing what happens. But here, we can just derive that using quantum mechanics in 10 minutes or so. Um, so again, this shows the power of the statistical mechanics we're going through and kind of the, the impetus for doing all of this thermodynamic nonsense um, in the first place. So let us switch back here to the slides. Okay, so we successfully derived the ideal gas law, but this is not really what we'll be doing for the next couple of weeks. In fact, what we'll be doing is more of the first step, looking at the bulk properties of thermodynamics. And so what we're gonna do is start with some of these thermodynamic definitions that we need to know to be able to communicate and talk about thermodynamics. So in thermodynamics, we will consider a system and that the system is basically what we are looking at. Uh, this can change based on the setup and setting up the proper system is going to be key to getting the right answer. So say we want to know we have a balloon, we put a certain number of, of molecules of, of gas in there and we want to know what the pressure, temperature and volume are, that balloon is our system. And the system is the thing that we are studying. Now, there are other things in the universe besides the thing that we are studying, and what we'll call that in thermodynamics is the surroundings. So the surroundings is everything that is not the system. Um, so if, our, if our, uh, our system is a balloon, the surroundings is the room that the balloon's in, and really technically the surroundings is literally everything else that is not the system, like the entire universe that's not what we're studying right now. Um, and these two things, you'll be very familiar with using them over the course of the next few weeks. There are a few kinds of systems that we can have. So the first kind of system we can have is an open system. And so this is a system that can exchange matter and energy with the surroundings. Um, and we can also have a closed system, a system that cannot exchange matter with the surroundings, but can exchange energy with the surroundings. And the final type of system that we have for thermodynamics is an isolated system. And this is a system that can neither exchange matter nor energy with the surroundings. So we'll go over some examples of these in class. And this will be your first homework assignment will be to come up with some examples of open, closed, and isolated systems. And the last thing that we will talk about on this slide here is what we call a boundary. And the boundary is the interface between these systems and the surroundings. So the, the idea of a boundary, I think can be one hand, it sounds kind of obvious, but it, it's a little strange because a boundary doesn't actually have to be a real thing. So we can have a boundary that is, uh, I put gas into a balloon and that gas is separated from the room, the surroundings by the latex of the balloon. Right, that's a very obvious boundary. But we can also have a, an, an artificial boundary. We can say, well, I want to study what's going on in my Olympic-sized swimming pool, but that's too much. So I'm going to split it up into chunks of one liter cubes of water. And I have this kind of artificial boundary, but my thing I'm studying is still that one liter chunk that's my system. And there's not really a physical boundary, but there's a theoretical boundary between my system and the surroundings. So we'll have some of that on uh, the homework as well. So what kind of boundaries can we have? Basically, if we have a real physical boundary and not a theoretical boundary, there are two types of boundaries that we can have. We can have uh, one type of boundary. So we have two systems here and these systems are at different pressures. If they have the same number of molecules, which a quick count would reveal that they do in the same volume, that means that a different pressure is directly related to a different temperature. So, I can bring two, these two systems into contact and they can retain their original pressures, retain their original temperatures. Now, this boundary is not allowing energy to flow across it. And uh, so heat doesn't go between this boundary and we call this boundary adiabatic. 
Um, so this is a, a boundary, a barrier that does not allow heat transfer. In another case, we could have these systems reach the same final pressure, the same final temperature, and this would be a, a, bear, a boundary that is diathermal and it allows heat to transfer between the two systems. And we'll go into more careful definition of what heat is uh, next time. But heat is a form of energy. We'll talk about that, the first law of thermodynamics in the next lecture. Uh, we'll look here briefly at the zeroth law of thermodynamics, now that we're talking about energy transfer between systems. So the zeroth law of thermodynamics tells us that two systems that are separately in thermal equilibrium with the third system are also in thermal equilibrium with each other. So this kind of sounds very obtuse. So what is really going on here? What does it mean for a system to be at thermal equilibrium with another system? Well, it means they're at the same temperature. So what we can do with this is this uh, zeroth law allows us to determine if two systems are in thermal equilibrium without actually bringing them next to each other. So what I can do is I can take one system, I can put a device in it, and that device can tell me what the thermal equilibrium of one system is. I put that device in another system, if it has the same value, the systems are both in equilibrium, all three are in equilibrium with each other. What this looks like is a thermometer. So temperature, if we think about it, and we'll do a little bit of thinking about temperature in class, is a very strange thing. So we know that at absolute zero, there is no motion of molecules, but at zero degrees Celsius, there is. And, and what really does it mean to be at zero degrees Celsius? Well, it means the, the mercury has a certain volume or, or various other things. And essentially the way that we measure temperature for us as humans is not in the motions of molecules, but in the bulk properties of things like mercury or, or the conductivity of a platinum wire if you have a metal thermometer. So these, this kind of idea of temperature is even a little bit strange and it's intricately uh, woven in with energy and we'll look about this more uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, on a final note here, um, an important part of what we'll be doing in class, especially in the first uh, uh, weeks here, is looking at equations of state. So equations of state, this is kind of a fancy word that really means an equation that relates the state variables. And we'll, we'll go into more about what state uh, variables and state functions are next time as well. These are basically normal variables. That's enough for now. Is that there's a system that relates to the variables. So for the ideal gas law, we have the observation that if we have a system at high pressure and low volume, as we decrease the pressure, the volume increases. As we increase the temperature, the pressure increases. So all three of these variables are related. Um, and that's not to mention the variable that could be in the number of moles uh, of gas. We're usually going to keep that constant, but there are a few important situations where it will change, namely chemical reactions, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. So there are a couple kinds of variables that we can have. The first kind of variable is an intensive variable. And these are variables that are independent of the size of the system. We can also have extensive variables. And these are variables that are proportional to the size of the system. I think it can be a little bit hard to grasp the, maybe the difference between these uh, at first as to what makes a variable extensive. So you can see here in the slide that pressure and temperature are intensive and uh, uh, volume is extensive. And what does this, this mean and, and why do we have these sorts of things? It's important for us moving forward. So learn this now and it will help us going forward. But most variables are going to be extensive. So pressure and temperature are kind of weird in that they're intensive. So imagine you have a can of soda in your fridge and you want to know what's going on at your system. You want to know what's going on with that system. Well, that can of soda is at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, not really because of anything that's going on with it, just because it's sitting in your fridge. So the fact that it's sitting in the fridge gives it a temperature. The temperature is not related to the number of molecules, the size, right, N of the system. And the pressure isn't either. So that can of soda was pressurized in a plant and it has a certain pressure. I did a quick Google search here. It's usually about three or four atmospheres of pressure uh, inside that can. And that also doesn't have anything to do with the number uh, of, of molecules in the system. However, if I increased the number of molecules in the system, say instead of a can, I had a two liter uh, of soda in my fridge. Now the temperature is still 40 degrees Fahrenheit, 
the temperature is still like three or four bar, three or four atmospheres, but the volume is now two liters instead of 12 fluid ounces. So increasing the size of the system changes the volume while it doesn't necessarily change the pressure and temperature. Now, that being said, if I had a can of soda and I somehow pumped molecules into that can of soda with a, a size couldn't change, the pressure and temperature would of course change. It's not quite what we're talking about here. Um, but we're saying that pressure and temperature come from something that's not necessarily based on the size of the system, whereas volume does. What we'll see going forward is that most properties are extensive variables. So one of the first ones we'll look at is heat capacity. And maybe you remember heat capacity from Gen Chem or high school. Uh, but heat capacity is a number that talks about how much energy it takes to change the temperature of a system. Now, this is obviously an extensive variable. So for example, it's going to take way less energy to boil uh, one cup of water than it would to boil the ocean, uh, to change the temperature of the ocean, because the ocean is huge. It's going to take a whole lot more energy. So what we often do is rather than considering a raw heat capacity that's extensive and based on the system, is we'll consider like a molar heat capacity. Uh, so it always takes a certain amount of energy to increase the temperature of one mole of water. Doesn't matter what really the whole system is because it's a per molar unit of energy. Um, and that's why you'll remember things uh, from, from Gen Chem, you'll have things like, I remember that the units of uh, free energy were in kilojoules per mole, and that makes that an intensive variable. So keep that in mind. The last thing I want to mention, and this is going to be a constant problem or a challenge for us in this class, is units. So the units in thermodynamics are varied. Uh, so we have a lot of units and often we don't work in SI units. We work in different units that are more convenient. So the, the SI unit for pressure is the Pascal. Uh, atmospheric pressure is 101,325 Pascals. Um, and it will typically work in a nice round number of one bar. So if your pressure is one bar and you're trying to plug that into an equation where you're trying to get out like a mass of an object, you're going to have to remember to convert your bars into SI units to do this. Um, and this uh, comes in a, a lot as well. Another very interesting thing to note is that a liter times a bar, and we'll see this more next time, is actually, you can relate that to a joule. So one liter bar or 100, uh, yeah, one liter bar is 100 joules or 0 0.1 kilojoules. So we'll have a bunch of different gas constants as well based on whether or not we're using liter bars or joules. And it all depends on the context. So as you're uh, going through a problem and trying to solve it, focus on the context and say, well, what are my units? What should my units be to get the right answer? Because it will depend on the equations you're using and the other units you've used. And you don't want to mess up and do everything right, but plug in, you know, uh, atmospheres instead of Pascal's and get a nonsense answer and mess yourself up for an hour. So keep uh, focus on these units. All right. So to conclude here, our thermodynamics goes far beyond simple things like delta G gives free energy. Uh, and that's why we can spend a whole semester uh, in a class called thermodynamics. It's not just one little small unit of Gen Chem, but it extends way beyond uh, free energy. Our first focus in this class is going to be on bulk properties of things using the ideal gas law mainly. Uh, then we'll extend further from there. But always keep in mind that these bulk properties we're looking at whether it's pressure, internal energy, like we'll see next time, free energy, anything like this, is based off of quantum mechanics. So when the energy of a system changes, there is something going on in terms of quantum mechanics. And we'll look at that at the end of the semester with um, statistical mechanics. It's also really important to get down these basic thermodynamic definitions. You're going to want to be very familiar with things like adiabatic, isolated systems, diathermal, state equations, uh, and so forth. So go through the slides here um, and, and really just take some time to memorize what these things are. You'll be uh, better off for it if you can memorize what these things are. Uh, with that, I will uh, let you guys go and we'll talk about this stuff more in class.